Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we're discussing the use of the glucocorticoids in the treatment of uh, asthma. Okay, so we've seen how we can use inhaled glucocorticoids uh, as prophylaxis for uh, asthma. Okay, well now what we want to discuss is the use of the oral glucocorticoids uh, in the treatment of asthma. And these um, would be reserved for very severe asthma because these are going to basically produce full-on immunosuppression. Okay, so oral glucocorticoids. Okay, so let's see the examples of oral glucocorticoids. So the famous examples are hydrocortisone, uh, which is the same molecule basically as cortisol, which is the endogenous hormone. So when we administer it, we don't call it cortisol, instead we call it hydrocortisone, okay? But the endogenous hormone is called cortisol. Okay, right. Uh, another example is prednisone, okay? Now, prednisone is a very commonly used oral glucocorticoid, and it has to be activated by the liver. So prednisone is the pro-drug, okay? Uh, so it has to be converted in the liver to prednisolone, which is the actual active drug. Uh, with the um, glucocorticoid effects. Okay, so prednisone is the pro-drug which is actually administered, whereas prednisolone is the active drug which is actually going to have the um, effect within the body. Now, these two are quite short-acting um, glucocorticoids. They have to be regularly retaken, okay? Um, there are a few longer-acting ones. So, for instance, triamcinolone is sort of medium-length uh, Okay, and then finally the longest one is dexamethasone. Okay, so hydrocortisone, um, prednisone, triamcinolone, and dexamethasone. Right, so these drugs can all be used uh, to treat severe asthma. Okay, now how? How are they going to treat severe asthma? Well, firstly, they're going to do everything that the inhaled glucocorticoids have done because they're in the blood, so they will do everything that the inhaled glucocorticoids do to prevent asthmatic attacks, but they will do more than that because they're going to be able to cause immunosuppression. Okay, so what will happen is they will go into uh, the T cells uh, within your um, lymph nodes, basically, and they can stop the production of interleukin-2. Now, if you remember the uh, activation pathway for T cells, you had to produce interleukin-2, because when a T cell received signal 2 uh, and signal 1, it then produced interleukin-2 and interleukin-2 receptor alpha, and then uh, that interleukin-2 caused an autocrine signal on the t uh, CD4 positive naive T cell itself, which then triggered um, the signal 3 within that CD4 positive naive T cell. Okay, so you're not going to get any primary immune responses actually occurring because you can't activate your T cells anymore. So this stops T cell activation. Okay, but it's going to do more than that. It's not just going to stop naive uh, T cell activation. It's also going to stop the activation of the memory T helper 2 cells. So remember, we discussed that some of the T helper 2 cells from the primary response will differentiate into memory T helper 2 cells, and these can then be activated by uh, professional antigen presenting cells presenting the antigen back to them. Okay, but the activation process also involves interleukin 2. It involves pretty much the exact same process as for naive CD4 positive T cells. Okay, so you're neither are you going to get the activation of the memory T cells that were. Um, for this allergen, basically. Okay, so you're not going to be able to get T cell activation. Now, you might say, well, maybe we don't need T cell activation because, remember, we discussed about memory B cells. So, presumably, you had the primary exposure and the primary adaptive immune response long ago when you were a child and you weren't taking the oral glucocorticoid then. If you had, it would have stopped the primary immune response and we wouldn't be in this mess. Uh, but uh, we've had the primary immune response now and surely we've got memory B cells, which we said... Most people believe memory B cells can be activated by the allergen alone, i.e. they don't need T cells, okay? So how are we going to stop that? Because we're not 
going to stop the memory B cells being activated and therefore we're not going to stop the reproduction of the IgE. So this doesn't seem as though it's that useful. But of course, um, glucocorticoids have other mechanisms. Okay, so they also go into B cells as well as T cells and induce something known as glucocorticoid induced apoptosis. And this is a very poorly understood uh, phenomenon. Okay, so they go into lymphocytes, both T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, and cause them to apoptose. So basically, these glucocorticoids are going to purge out your memory B cells and also your memory T cells against these, uh, this allergen, basically. So, uh, if we remove all of the memory B cells, let's say, and that's a bit extreme, they won't quite cause that, but let's say they've removed all the memory B cells, then what's going to gradually happen is IgE levels are just going to go down and down and down and down and down, and you're going to have nothing that's replenishing the IgE, even if you're exposed to the allergen. Because we have now stopped the activation of T cells and we've removed the memory B cells, then you're not going to get any new IgE being produced against that allergen. So gradually, if you take this drug for long enough, IgE levels will go down and down and down and down and down within your body. The mast cells will no longer have IgE on their surface, and therefore when you breathe in the allergen, it's not going to trigger uh, the asthmatic attack in the way that it used to. So these drugs are extremely effective at stopping asthmatic attacks, and they work by depleting the IgE, basically, by producing this immunosuppressant effect. Okay, now, um, what should be said, noted is that um, these drugs are going to produce complete immunosuppression. Okay, um, they are stopping T cell activation, and they're also killing T and B lymphocytes haphazardly. Okay, uh, so that is going to stop you initiating primary immune responses and also secondary immune re immune responses against antigens which actually deserve the immune response being initiated against them. Okay, and that means that you are going to basically cut the adaptive immune response hugely. And the adaptive immune response is really useful in actually clearing uh, infections that you have. So, people on um, long-term oral glucocorticoids will have increased risk of getting infections, okay? Uh, so immunosuppressants all produce uh, increased uh, incidence of infections. Okay, so that's why these drugs are kind of one of the last uh, go-tos, basically, for the treatment of asthma, the most extreme treatment that you can use because they do produce immunosuppression. Okay, now the final little thing I just want to discuss is something to do with the resistance to steroids. So glucocorticoids are all steroids, okay? Uh, so I want to discuss how you can get resistance to these glucocorticoids. Okay, so how can you get glucocorticoid resistance? Well, there are two mechanisms by which we have found uh, that glucocorticoid resistance can occur. And let me just highlight what glucocorticoid resistance is. So if you use these drugs for a long period of time, then the effect of them goes down and down and down and down, basically. Uh, so gradually they become less effective, and you have to then start taking more of them to achieve the same effect, okay? So that's what I mean by glucocorticoid resistance. Okay, so how do you get glucocorticoid resistance? Well, one of the mechanisms that has been found is that you can find that the glucocorticoid receptors can end up being phosphorylated. Okay, so here's a glucocorticoid receptor, and some of them can end up phosphorylated. Okay, now when you have glucocorticoid receptors that are phosphorylated, even if the glucocorticoid binds to them, and they uh, lose their um, binding partners, okay, so that part hasn't been affected. The glucocorticoid will still come in and bind to the glucocorticoid receptor, and uh, it will lose its binding partners. It will then dimerize with another glucocorticoid receptor. The problem comes now that it can't translocate into the nucleus once it's phosphorylated in this way. So phosphorylation of the glucocorticoid receptor can stop the translocation of the glucocorticoid receptor dimer into the nucleus. That's one mechanism that we've seen of resistance. This is how you therefore reduce the efficacy of the drug. Okay. Uh, in addition 
another mechanism that we've seen for resistance is that somehow uh, the glucocorticoids become incapable of inducing uh, acetylation of histone 4 at position 5, okay? So you can't acetylate lysine at position 5, basically. So there seems to be some problem with the acetylation at position 5. So basically what will happen is the glucocorticoid will bind to the glucocorticoid receptor, it will uh, dissociate from its binding partners, form a glucocorticoid receptor dimer, go into the nucleus, bind to the promoter regions, set up that complex which forms the histone acetyl transferase, and that then isn't capable of acetylating the histone, uh, the, um, histone 4 on the uh, lysine in position 5, basically. And then if you don't acetylate that, then the DNA doesn't loosen around the histone optima, and therefore you don't get increased expression in the way you should. That's another mechanism that has been uh, found uh, in people with uh, glucocorticoid resistance. Okay, so those are just two things to think about as potential mechanisms by which uh, the efficacy of glucocorticoids binding to glucocorticoid receptors can be reduced within a cell.